You good? Good. Good. Oh, hi, Arizona PowerShell. Uh, I'm Brad with Tech Systems. Um, we're the leading IT services provider. Um, I specifically focus here in the Phoenix area, but Tech Systems is worldwide. So we're a good resource. If you guys are just looking for a new role, opportunities, just want to know what's going on in the market, uh, you can reach us at our website. You can find local resources there. And now you guys, my card's right here. Have a good one. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank you. See you guys. All righty, how's everybody doing? Uh, my name is Cole, and uh, I'm going to be helping Tom run the Arizona PowerShell user group. Hey, how's it going? So, a lot of new faces. Um, I uh, was attending the PowerShell user group pretty regularly um, about two years ago, and then I, I, for a little while, didn't attend. So, a lot of new faces. I don't know if you guys have been coming, and, and uh, or if this is your first time uh, in a while or anything like that, but um, I'll try to, you know, maybe after, get to know you all a little bit. and. Um, Myself. Uh, so thank you guys all for coming. This is a great turnout. Um, it's going to be super casual. Um, please speak up uh, if you have anything to add. Like definitely just jump right in, and, and we can uh, open up the conversation. Um, my PowerShell level. I should actually do the um, on Plural Site. They have a, a skill checker, and it kind of ranks you. Last time I did that was about like a year and a half ago, and I think it put me right at fifty. So. Like, I'm for sure not an expert at PowerShell. Uh, it's something that I learned and it completely transformed my career and I'm still, I would say, at an intermediate level and, and I've got a ton to go. And, and I'll um, build some scripts that are just uh, you know, basically a, a long one-liner <laughs> and, um, and I'm sure I'm doing things not in the best way. Um, so actually I have a script that I, I made about uh, a week and a half ago now and I'd love to share it with you guys and, and get some feedback because I already know that there's a few things that I'm doing I could do better and so I'd love to some sessions we can work on that. Uh, today we're going to be going over PowerShell 7. Um, so I put together some slides on some kind of just really uh, overview of PowerShell 7 and what that means. Um, and then there's a, a quick video we can take a look at as well from Jason actually showing one of the, uh, the new features. It's the for each parallel. Pretty cool. Um, yeah, with that said, I'll jump right into it. Again, feel free at any point, if you have anything to add or, or have a question, just jump right in. It'll be real casual. So, um, When PowerShell 6 came out, it uh, brought a uh, what's called PowerShell Core, which basically is Microsoft's cross-platform PowerShell product. Um, however, the commandlets that were in PowerShell version 6 or PowerShell Core was greatly reduced. Um, and so most people, and still to this day, are still running PowerShell version 5. Um, so here's a screenshot I just did on my computer, for example, and, and sure enough, I'm running PowerShell version 5.1. Uh, in order to get PowerShell version 6 or 7, you do have to go and manually install it. Um, so most everybody today is still running PowerShell version 5. In, uh, in PowerShell Core, so basically since version 6, um, uh, I don't have the, the graph here, but if anybody saw that quick little video I did on, on Twitter and LinkedIn, there's this uh, adoption curve. Um, when PowerShell fires up, it actually sends a, a little information back to Microsoft about that. And uh, there's been this really healthy uh, curve of growth for PowerShell startups. Basically, it's all Linux. It's funny to see that um, Windows basically stays flat. Most Windows people aren't like going and downloading the new, they kind of just like, uh, yeah, are just sticking with whatever's baked in. Um, but the Linux community is adopting it, which is great to see. Um, so Microsoft investment in like supporting other operating systems like Linux, which we're seeing across the board, like especially in Azure, we're seeing a ton of support for open source uh, software, which is really cool, a big shift in Microsoft. Um, but the adoption of PowerShell Core has been very strong, which is great. And uh, PowerShell version 7 will now no longer have two separate versions. It's all going to be condensed. Um, and a lot of the reason why... Uh, we were able to do that. PowerShell version <coughs> 7 is built on .NET Core uh, 3.0, which brought back a lot of the, I think there's some, um, somehow basically they're able to support a lot of the legacy commandlets that were missed in PowerShell version 6. So it's actually PowerShell version 7, I think doesn't have all of the full commandlet support, but it has the majority. 
Um, some requirements for PowerShell version 7, <coughs> the universal C runtime must be installed and the Windows management uh, framework. So I, I believe both of these are gonna already uh, be set and installed in, in anything in Windows 10. Um, and also with the Windows management framework, I think even Windows 8 uh, includes 4.0. So basically it would just be like if you had seven or older um, or universal C, I think if you had anything below Windows 10. Uh, and same, you know, Windows 10 and Server 2019 or 2016, I believe, so. So installing uh, PowerShell 7, you can manually install it with an MSI. Um, and so you would go to the uh, GitHub and, and get that from there. Um, oh, all right. Oh, cool, no internet, it's fine. Um, so. Hello, Josh. <laughs> I'm looking at my screen thinking it's working. But yeah, you can download the MSI and, um, you know, uh, install it just locally to your own machine, or you can kind of deploy it uh, using that uh, boot policy maybe to push that MSI. It would be an easy way to, to get that out to your network. Um, you can also install um, right from PowerShell. So you can install PowerShell using PowerShell. So um, this command right here in the middle, this is the alias for uh, invoke expression, um, but it's basically calling out to uh, a script that then installs that MSI. Uh, and down below, um, I think it was Jeff Hicks made a, a module um, just to make it a little bit easier. So you can actually just write in PowerShell, run install module, uh, PS release tools, and then uh, install the PS preview. And so once it's installed, um, you would open it up by, from the command line, typing PowerShell or pswsh-preview. And um, once PowerShell version 7 goes to general availability, which I believe is this month, uh, you would no longer need the preview, but it would just be <coughs> PowerShell, pwsh. So what's new? Um, the uh, Windows compatibility, which I believe is, um, kind of when they talk about bringing back a lot of the commandlets that were lost. And so, um, yeah, bridging the gap between the uh, regular PS non-core, which would be like PowerShell version 5.1, and the PowerShell core versions with respect to the number of commandlets available. Um, yep, basically saying the, uh, it brings the, the parity closer. Again, it's still not complete. There's still gonna be some <coughs> commandlets not in PowerShell 7, I believe that, 5.1 will still have. Um, and then uh, on that .NET Core, so it's the first command line shell um, packaged on .NET Core 3.0. Um, and I believe, I don't know if I included this, but this improved performance quite a bit as well. Um, so that was uh, pretty interesting to see. Um, I pulled a couple, so there's a lot of different um, new additions. A lot of it, to be completely honest, is a little bit um, above me, and I don't, I'm not fully there yet. So I kind of pulled some that I thought were interesting, and then I have links to the uh, page with more, so we can look at that. But some of the ones that I thought were interesting were, um, you know, get clipboard, set clipboards back, but it's um, a cross-platform available, so you can uh, use it on on Linux and Mac and uh, Windows as well. So that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Um, this I actually saw uh, a few people talking about um, secure credential management. So I haven't actually uh, dove into this and then had any experience with it, but um, it mentions that you uh, <coughs> it's a way that you can not have to include uh, credentials in your script. Um, and I know that there's ways of not including your credentials in your script, um, but it seems like there's a uh, an upgrade in here that makes it even easier. I think they call it the yeah the credential store. We're gonna actually just kind of read about this recently and haven't been able to really play with it at all. But um, it seems to be pretty cool as quite a few people are talking about it. Centralized logging. Um, so whether you're uh, executing on a remote or locally, the logs are generated to stay on the local device. Um, OS agnostic as well, which is cool. And we connect to the network so we can take a look at these. Do you know if they're putting the console in it? The console they released earlier this year? Do you know if they're tying it to that? The, the new console? Yeah. 
Uh, I think so, actually, because um, the video that we'll watch with Jason, I'm pretty sure they're uh, in the new console. Really? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, no, the brand new console that gets divorced from con, conhost.exe, because mm -hmm. the main PowerShell exe is tied to conhost, if I remember right. I think that's oh, the name of it. Have you know, no or idea. console host or something like console.exe, something like that. Forget the exact name. I haven't tried it yet. Tried it? Get my mobile hotspot going. Um, yeah. Can you play some sound quickly? Make sure I can pick up sound. Yeah, I'm in from the computer, but yeah. Hmm. You actually have it running, dude? Do you have the preview run? No, I was going to install it, so... Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> You're tempting the demo gods? I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, he's a glutton for punishment. Well, he should learn from my mistakes of trying to get things working on the fly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this is from um, when they updated uh, Preview 6, or came out with Preview 6. So uh, they come out with new Preview. It was on a monthly cadence. Um, and then on, in December, I think they were uh, kind of like the packaging for general availability. So um, definitely, uh, if you're interested, dive into some of the other previews. But um, So this here, this null conditional um, member property for method access, I, I guess I was reading, um, this can in some cases replace an if-then statement. Um, I guess because here, null. But this new syntax makes it more clear on the intent of the script. I love variable names to end with the Yeah. Um, Again, just in full transparency, I'm not going to pretend like I, I uh, know what all this means for sure. So uh, if anybody sees something that seems interesting, just call out and we can stop and talk about it. Here's that clipboard command that says we were saying. Um, this performance counter, get-counter, uh, I'm not sure if anybody has worked with this quite a bit, but I hadn't. I'm, I'm using a... Uh, I think, I, I think I'm using measure dash commandment or something like that in my command to, to or uh, I measure the runtime, but this performance counter um, was more specific to measuring your um, your processor's performance and things like that. Oh. Yeah, this video, if it shows us anything cool. That'd be cool. Is it just copying off of like perf one? I'm not sure actually. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we got good at sound here. Mm. There is no sound in this one. So oh, okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> we can make sound, right? Get counter. <laughs> Uh, graphical tools, I guess, because of um, .NET Core 3.0, we can bring back out GridView. Uh, update list, out printer, the recycle bin only supported on Windows. <laughs> okay. I thought I saw some stuff on like LS or get child item. How did they resolve that? Have you had a chance to look? Hmm. I didn't see <coughs> on, on that actually. Yeah. Because um, in the in the core in core you, you can't obviously you're not going to be doing dirt. You got to go LS or whatever. 
Hmm. Or, but uh, it's, uh, that's one of those complex things where you've got the difference between uh, uh, Windows and Linux, Linux commands. Hmm. Like um, ls-la works, but um, Dir would not, and that's because right, there's... you got aliases, because uh -huh. they're aliases. There's you between two different aliases to hmm. come in with, and does that work? Hmm. They, it, 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 that was for some of the first bugs they found with PowerShell 6 before like the first. Yeah, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, so I'm not sure how and they... And they should have solved it. I'm not sure how they did it. I yeah. thought I saw something go by up there. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah it, was, it was a little bit of a bug. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. So there's Dir, it seems like it's working at least uh, there. Okay. Hey, pass the stickers around now, put it back in my bag. I actually need to grab uh, two more of those, get my new service. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Watch that set you back. <laughs> yeah, some Tom? No, the service. <coughs> oh. Uh, it's company laptop. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Zero I don't think that's up a lot of people. Nice. Had a meeting with a guy and his was covered. It was a company yeah, laptop. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's a couple interesting ones on, on this article as well that I saw. Um, yeah. I, I, so is this what it is? Um, yeah. The new um, pipeline chain operators, like double ampersand. Uh, is now supported, and I think it's similar to um, <laughs> yeah, and or or lists. Um, so if anybody's familiar, it looks like maybe just this syntax is now supported. These double ambers, double pipes. So the stuff that you use in Linux Bash will work. <coughs> that Linux mm. admins and I make it more familiar for them because mm. you use that a lot for when you do like like a pipe it's not a pipeline but it's like you're dealing with standard error and standard out and that kind of stuff mm. cool useful. yeah thank you I couldn't think of the word thank you what so, you said redirection so. yeah. Um, it's pretty interesting. PowerShell was the first kind of language that I ever learned, and, and then I did a, um, a Linux couple of Linux get, getting started, and so just any of these other like tools like uh, Bash or some of the Linux tools, man, um, you got your switches or your parameters. You got a dash lowercase a or a dash m or a dash, you know, and they have it doesn't have any um, connection to what it's going to do, and it just makes me think like I'm, PowerShell is amazing because um, you know, the parameter is going to be something like dash no clobber, and you, you can just start to, you know, tab it out. So it's really like a, a long parameter name isn't um, that big of a deal, and uh, I appreciate it so much more than these Linux commands. They're just like, oh, yeah, you know, you're going to do this dash A, dash L for, you know, and it's, so it's, I wish more, um, as I'm learning other tools and languages, I wish there were more, I think it's verbose or whatever, the, yeah, it's like, man, PowerShell is pretty great for that. Uh, this is interesting. I guess there's a new PowerShell version notification. So like in the um, shell, it'll notify you if you're not in the latest version, which is new in uh, 7. Uh, tab completion for burial assignment. I think this is something that's been in PowerShell for a long time. So it seems like um, we're just seeing a lot of like basic functionality be baked into PowerShell 7. but um. <laughs> uh, this one was pretty cool. Um, select string emphasis. Uh, 
basically it's highlighting the uh, string that you expected. How's that work if you pass it into a variable? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. I mean, that's what cool, does, but... Does it highlight? Does it actually do something? It should do something like get, get content. It, yeah. pull, pull like a whole text file in and then, then just do a select string. So you're doing like a, almost like a graph. Yeah. That'd be helpful if you're working on a regular expression. Yes, it's in the ball. Wouldn't that be nice? I mean, yeah. the fact that it would do that, it would tell you what you're actually a regular expression is. But you don't have to go to regex.com or whatever. Oh, you still have to do that. Yeah, to find the right regex. <laughs> well, to relearn it. Because every time you use regex, you have to relearn it. Yeah. <laughs> So you know what's pretty cool, and I think this is, um, I, I might be wrong, but how it's saying this was uh, a hack of the Noi project by Derek that uses inverse cloud, so our colored text. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but PowerShell is now open source, and so they have the, all of this, the code on GitHub, and you can actually um, <coughs> you know, contribute and things like that. So it seems like that this feature that's part of PowerShell version 7 for everybody was introduced by Derek in Illinois, which is pretty freaking cool. So, um, again, like kind of Microsoft really going towards that open source model. All right. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So, um, let's see. Let's go ahead and uh, give it a go and see if we can install PowerShell version 7. So, I'm just going to do it from a regular um, console. I'm going to try it with this module and we'll see if that works. My brother and his uh, girlfriend just had a baby like an hour ago. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, we should make a module name and effort. <laughs> First time on call. What's that? First time on call? Nah, uh, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm the youngest brother, and I, I was the first to have. I have two kids. <laughs> uh, I, uh, let's not do it in quiet mode and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, I should have. You know. get all these scanners and you know, it all kinds of nice yellow text. I think yeah, yeah, that's what the December... So, um, Jason Helmick actually uh, also just started doing a, um, you can find it, it's called The Show. <coughs> and I think there's only about seven episodes right now, but I just started watching it last night, and it's, uh, Pretty cool. So um, Jason just joined the uh, PowerShell team at Microsoft. What? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Chrome or Firefox? That's Chrome. Oh, uh, I was gonna say maybe you can use a new picture. Oh, that's cool. I thought that was a ver like a feature of Pluralsight when I had that. No, that's it just came out. It's also a feature of Chrome. Is it? Yeah, you just need a plugin. Oh well, it's, not, it's part of Firefox. It's, it's part not. of Chrome as well. It just but you just need a plugin. That doesn't mean it's part you, of. It. No, no, you have to go through the flags to enable it. Oh, the plugin yeah. that makes it easy. You just have okay. I thought you meant like an actual download some app third party plugin. That's how Chrome works. There's no default. I, I think you're going to have problems with volume. I think so? Yeah. Because you're going through my system so I can record the system. Oh, there you go. Now, as we're working towards the major release of PowerShell 7, four wow, of the of projects that yeah, I have yeah, think it looks way different. tasks in those projects. Yeah. Well, they take yeah, a long so time. Good. I just can't get them all done at once. I know I say I'm a multitasking kind of guy, but at the end of the day, I'm a single-threaded dude, and I just don't have it at my single core to get more oh work God, done. Really? Only there were two of me. Is that the secret? Is he gonna... Yeah, so this one's pretty pretty cool. Because um, two is always better than one. Well, not so much with guitars, but at least with PowerShell. Yes, PowerShell has had parallelism since V2 with promoting and background jobs. But if you were somebody that worked with workflow like I did, you saw some other ways to use parallelism with for each that was amazing. Now, for each dash object has that built in, and it's going to be in PowerShell 7. So let's take a look. So while this is a quick introduction to using of for each object, I'm going to give you some documentation as well. Now you can see yeah, that I'm on a console. Mac right now, and uh, this is just terminal on a Mac, uh, which the new like console looks console. real similar. Yeah. But I think it's so cool, like when you see this, like a lot of the demos, just people right on a Mac using PowerShell. It's pretty uh, uh, sweet. The current release of PowerShell Seven, which is the release candidate, will clear the screen, and let's start out with a range operator. Now, a range operator simply counts from one number to the next. And what I want to do is, I kind of want to review something with you. I'm going to pipe this to for each object. And this also is how you would normally see it utilized. Chromebooks, you guys can, you can install, because um, you can install the Linux subsystem, I think, on the Chromebook and then run PowerShell on a Chromebook too. When you see it on the inner tubes or whatever. I'm going to put in the squiggly braces, and in whatever I put inside of the squiggly braces is going to execute each time one of those numbers is counted. So basically, five times I'm going to get something. What do I want? I'm going to put dollar sign underscore, and this means I'm going to get the current object coming across the pipeline, which will get displayed, which will again be those numbers. Now, the reason that I just showed this to you was because we're missing something here in front of this squiggly brace. What we're missing is, is the parameter that goes here. Normally, there's a parameter, and because you're not accustomed to seeing it most of the time, New feature can sometimes get hidden. The parameter that goes in front of that code block is called dash process. And when you run that, you get exactly what we have been getting, what you expect. The new feature to have for each object do parallelism is to switch dash process to parallel. Don't try to add it to the end. That's not what the goal is. It won't work that way. And that's what a lot of people initially started trying. So it's parallel, and now you have the new feature, and the new feature will now kick in and work. In other words, for each object will now run in parallel. Now, you're not seeing a visual difference between dash process and dash parallel now, and that's because I want to give you a little bit of a warning. So look, parallelism isn't the silver bullet in the world of Firewall. In other words, it's not going to solve all of your performance problems. In fact, might be surprised to see that it incurs some performance problems. See, when you start up parallelism with a for each object, that means that we're going to have to start run the space PowerShell. That means more memory, more processing. In other words, the setup costs us resources. Well, if you're just doing it like a DIR of your root drive, you're not going to need all of this parallelism startup in order to get the results that you want. So sometimes as you're testing this, kind of mindful of what you're testing it against. 
Uh, let me give you another analogy. It's kind of like mowing the lawn. If you only need a shotgun glass worth of grass, why would you fire up a lawnmower with gasoline and all that stuff when you could just use a pair of scissors? So when you use the parallelism switch, if you're on a VM with only a single core, well, you're probably not going to get the results that you want. If you're doing something very light on the file system, you're not going to get the results that you want. I'll tell you what, though, let me give you a couple of demonstrations, both on Linux and on Windows, where this might be a little bit more realistic for you. So now I have VS Code up, and rather than try to hand type all of this in, here's what I'd like to do is show you an example of something where parallelism does pay off, and that's when you're doing local large file moves. And in this case, I'm going to copy a bunch of VMs. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start this, and then I'll explain what I'm doing in the code. Let me go ahead and press F8, and it's loaded. And I'm going to go down here and clear the screen and start this function, which I just called test copy. So it'll start running. Now let's take a look at the code. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use measure command so that we get some time how long it took at the end of this. <coughs> so inside of measure command expression, I've got my range operator. I'm going to do this five times, and I've got it for each. And instead of process, I've got parallel. Now what am I doing? I'm going to create some folders, actually five folders, because I've used dollar sign underscore in the name of the folder. And I'm going to copy a bunch of virtual machines from one location to those five different locations in this case. <laughs> now, I'm actually copying about six or seven virtual machines. Um, so that's a pretty good large file copy. Now, one thing I want you to keep in mind, these are uh, virtual machines that are on my local system, and I'm moving them around on my local laptop. So Performance, yes, I'm going to get some pretty good performance out of it, but your performance mileage will vary, of course. So when this completes, I should get a time down here of how long it took. Oh, it just popped up. So about 58 seconds to move all of those large files. I need to tell you that in uh, tests that I've done where I've run this with dash process up here, it's taken over a few minutes, so like, like three minutes right around that time. So is this a huge difference, three minutes to one minute? In this case, well, if I extrapolated that out and had bigger volume sizes, things like that, yeah, this would be a pretty big difference. Now, there's another demonstration I want to show you. I have another reason that you could use parallelism to get some effective results. But for that, let's switch to Windows. Swoop my own sound effects. Hey, by the way, before I show you this other demo, have you seen the new terminal for Windows in PowerShell inside of the new terminal? Yeah, that's pretty awesome. But that's not why I'm here. Anyways, so let me bring up VS Code on Windows. And in this example, let me show you what I've got going here. Again, I'm going to go ahead and, and co not copy it, but go ahead and select this. Oh, out of control. Okay, so it's a little out of control. Anyways, there we go. And I'll press F8. So let me show you what I'm doing here as I get this guy started. And we're going to do pretty much the same thing. In this case, another great example of when to use uh, uh, parallelism on for each might also be when you're doing some log um, analysis. In this case, I'm looking at, well, my local Windows logs, and I've got several of the logs selected up here. I'm going to splat this log list in just a second. So if you take a look, I've got uh, the system applications, some PowerShell logs, and again, I'm going to use the same structure I did before. I'm going to measure this so you get an idea of the time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these logs, and I'm going to use for each parallel, and I'm going to use get win event so I can go through and look at each of those logs. And then you'll notice I'm doing a where object here. I wanted to find logs that, um, some of the logs that had errors or that had shown where something was downloaded. So I decided to grab those. So I'm actually analyzing some logs in a useful way. I'll sort through them, select them, and then add them to a file down here at the bottom. So I've broken it all out for you so you can take a look at it. Now, usually log analysis can take a long time to go through these logs. In this case, if you look down here, I got lucky and it finished in about 23 seconds. Oh, look, nice little firewall warning. Um, so it got finished in about 23 seconds. That's because I didn't have the system log in here, which would have taken me, oh, probably about 10 minutes. Now, if I had this as process instead of parallel, yeah, it takes considerably a lot longer to go through all those logs and 
this stuff. So yeah, this is a good example of another good use case for this. So at the end of the day, is the new feature of using Parallel going to be beneficial to you? Well, those of us that have been using it for a long time with workflow certainly found it out to be. And in the right cases, it will be helpful. One last thing I want to show you while I'm here. Let me go ahead and bring up my browser. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so that you can see what I'm going for. And, oh, I have it up. It's all ready to go. Here it is. Um, on the PowerShell team blog, Paul has written an excellent article on, for each parallel, the feature, how to use it, just as I've shown you, some, some use examples for it that go through and work with. He also goes through and spends a little bit of time of explaining how it works and some of the features to this. Some of the things that I haven't talked about in this quick intro, like the fact that you can set a throttle limit and that you can have for each um, parallel as background jobs. Also, some of the things you would take a look at is when it should be used and when things might not work out the way that you want. You'll have to experiment to get an idea. Along with this, and over the next several months, as we're going through the release of PowerShell 7, this is going to be a big deal. We'll have more documentation for you. There's going to be blogs, both the PowerShell team and the community starting up. And of course, we're going to have more training from our partners and from us, we'll do some as well, so that you can get more in depth with these features and this, along with all the other new features that I'm gonna be talking about in future episodes of the show. So. They're pretty cool. I thought that one was actually really cool. And uh, I thought it was interesting too, the um, for each dash of objects, and I'll normally just open the script blocks and start going, I never really thought about like, oh, there is a parameter there that it's calling in its process. Um, a lot. I'll have to try that out sometime in the parallel. Let's take a look and see how. So I guess quiet would maybe avoid um, these options and just go the defaults. So just running an MSI with the EXE. Now, would that uh, work on Mac and Linux? What kind of installation is when we have a Mac on Linux? Um, yeah, good question. <laughs> On installation, guys, like w where I copy my slides from to give credit, uh, Adam Bertrand, Adam the Automator, uh, and he's got actually a pretty good write-up on um, a few methods to deploy it as well. So one of them was through group policy. But definitely if you were looking for that, uh, he had a lot of great information on that. Right. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, and like I said, unless there's anything that anybody would like to, to look into on PowerShell 7, um, in VS Code. I'll change this other theme that's pretty uh, pretty cool. So, um, and this I'd actually uh, I'm. I'd love to hear feedback and um, maybe it's something that kind of jumps out like right away because so I, I like uh, I use right host quite a bit <laughs> um, kind of just where I'm at as far as uh, when I'm writing a script I like expect to see uh, text to the console um, but that actually ended up being pretty difficult when I was doing invoke command um, because the text isn't it's on that remote machine and so I wasn't getting it to my console so I was putting things into variables and then displaying those variables on my computer. Um, One thing that I use a lot is T object. Okay. You ever use T object? Mm -mm. So you can use T object and you can take the result set from whatever you're running and you can T it to the log <coughs> file as well to the console. 
Okay. Minutes. So you get you get two for one. Sweet. So I mean, more often than not, you need you depend on logs just as much as what you see. And that is like T object. T mm -hmm. hyphen object. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, again, guys, we're gonna go kind of off topic from PowerShell seven and just kind of looking at a script and and. Um, I'd very much encourage if anybody has any feedback or want to want to provide. Can you make the font bigger? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but if there's anything back to PowerShell seven, just just speak up and we'll we'll jump back to that. Um, Can you say I must be blind. I'm, I'm in the blind. We're in the blind. <laughs> that looks cool. <laughs> yeah. My settings file. <laughs> it might be easier in ISC if you just use a slider. In the yeah. Box. We'll show that. So that, oh, that worked anyway. Control plus. Oh no. In VS, VS Code is good. Oh, that's better. Now. That's yeah. a lot better. Yeah. 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 So uh, yeah. I basically get it. Um, as create an array of computers. Um, I'm, this is basically because we don't have anything like system center, my remote computers are very difficult to manage. Um, and so we're installing software. This script is just checking to see if the software is A, installed, and then B, is it configured correctly? There's a, a registry key that some of them have the software installed, but the registry key isn't configured correctly. So it'll um, update the registry to the correct um, value if it is incorrect um, and uh, I'm, I'm basically getting my 80 computers where the IP address is is not like my internal subnets um, so every time I run it it's just going to look against computers that the last time they checked in was uh, an IP address that our VPN um, well the subnet that the VPN computers will be in and we connected VPN um, I, I did this uh, computer count to get the number of computers that it, it grabbed and then um, setting dollar sign current PC this variable to zero and then for every time that it does a for each it does a, a plus one so that's like my counter I'll show you what that looks like so do you miss the first computer in the array then it it does mess up because it'll like um, not the first one in the array it ends up going correctly because but you're adding it first right so you missed uh, item zero. So me, you'll, you'll miss item zero in that scenario. I put the plus equal at the bottom of your for each loop. Okay, right. Because just it's, that that way. Well, it's, it's a it. it's not a it's like um, working on one of this many. Yeah, but whenever you're dealing with an array, it's usually zero index. Zero is first. So, and mm -hmm. zero is the very first one. So if you hit plus first, you'll always miss the first computer. You'll always miss zero. Because if you yeah. if you take like if you take dollar computers uh -huh. and then you put a square back bracket on the you know the square bracket mm -hmm. on either side and put the index number in the middle of there, mm -hmm. you'll see what's in the zero index. And there'll actually be something there. Binary. You follow me? Are you not on the, on the square brackets with the, the um... So like if if you just take a simple array like you know uh -huh. one, like yeah. one, two, three, four, five, six. Mm -hmm. If you load, zero is number load three. Get data in line three. That okay. So we'll call this like um, just call it A or something. Numbers, yeah. And then go <laughs> 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 away. I'm gonna have to start up this. Seven dollar numbers and then brackets. Zero. Zero. But we'll return one. The one in there would return two. Yeah. What, what was that? It'll return the second one. Yeah, do dollar numbers. <laughs> square. And now uh, use the square bracket by the curly. No, no, no. You're looking at item one. Mm -hmm. 
like this. Yeah. 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 Put zero in there. Now put a zero, zero in there. Yep. Yeah. Now run that. That should be the very first item in that array. Yeah, if the terminal ever works. Yeah. 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 Take that line first, right? Just F8. Just F8. Uh, there we go. There you go. No, there, you, there you go. That should be one. Good one? Yeah. It's a, um, so if you do a full reach, so you that's the index one. number of that array. That's, so get that's four. four bracket. If you put four in that in that box, uh -huh. it's five. Yeah. So in the fourth array in there, you'll be on the fifth number. Oh. Um. So because you're adding a one to the counter, before you go through the logic of your script, mm -hmm. you're looking at item one, which is now your second item in the whole array, not the first item. You're, so you're going, yeah. starting at computer two, not computer one, and you're going and yeah. You're so you should always oh. read it. In, hmm. um, you should always add at the end of the before it loops again. Okay. I mean, it should always be, a... be the last item. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's just proper etiquette. Awesome. Yes, of course. Well, that way you don't miss a zero index. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. actually a way to put it in the, for each declaration too. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. What's that? To um. So it's like for each before each. Is there a for each? I equals. I yeah, there plus, it is. I yeah. equals. Oh, that's not for each. That's just a for loop. That's just a for loop. Well, even if you're doing yeah, but if you're doing for each, it's the same thing. If you're looking for every object in an array and then trying to match that against something, mm -hmm. you obviously want to start with the first object. So either you have to add a zero to objects at the beginning of it, or you just have to start your zero. And it depends on what type of array you're using and what type of language you're in, but most arrays start at zero. So if you initiate first, it's already added an object in zero, and you are technically on object two no, no, plus when you there. start, mm -hmm. because because you you said plus plus, now you're on object two, run the script against it, come back around, now you're on object three. Whereas it should be object zero or object one, mm -hmm. and then plus plus. Then so it comes back around, does the next object, plus plus, then comes around, does the next object. Are you getting an error on the last item? Or is it saying null? Uh, when it's, the script runs, are you getting a, n a null item or something? No, because it's not it? using that um, you know, PC count or current PC to reference any object. It's just um, writing oh. host. <laughs> oh, maybe we should check that first. <laughs> We're not even using it. We got hung up on something that we didn't need to. <laughs> well, still, uh, My apologies. Yeah, I think it's but still it, better yeah, to... Yeah. Yeah. Good, it's good, good practice. Really good to know though. Yeah. The other thing that you can, yeah, you you're using plus equal one. Aren't you? <coughs> Never mind. You can mm -hmm. use plus plus the entire show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always use plus equal one though. Yeah, and I usually do that when I first started out all the time. I hope there was a revenue in here. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Maybe it's because I haven't eaten anything. Hey, there's a nice yeah. sub over there. Away. Away. I don't usually eat here. Actually, are you using that? I basically just run it on my as a scheduled task, and so then as soon no, as no, but at that are, that current PC variable, what you use? Oh yeah, so um, for each, the it's going to write host that oh. current array of computer count or yeah the just number. <laughs> oh yeah, so you're off by one then. Well, that's why he's adding the one before. Oh, I see. Okay. That's, yeah. Then there's, hey, then there's that slider at the bottom, dude. It makes it really easy to 
increase the bottom right corner. Makes it really easy for. Oh, I see. You're using it for account. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so like right here. Yeah, okay, um, so you're using it to indicate to the user where they're at, you're at in the account. Got spot. it. Yeah, in this case. Got it. Well, um, that makes sense now. Is it the same here. time every, is it skipping the same thing every time, right? Um, I don't know. Like the same machine each time. Because it's going to be a different, it, the, the count. Oh, is it pulls them in? It's going to be different every yeah, time? Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, right, the system name. That PCA is that is that the system name or is that just what you've identified it in the array as? Uh, system name. Okay. So that is the, so you're storing you're bringing in the system name and then storing it. Right. And yeah. then checking its state. Yeah. So basically, um, the where is this dash oh, for each computer and computers? Um, so command. It seems to be it's um, essentially like when Windows uh, remoting isn't enabled and it throws an error, mm -hmm. it doesn't write back. So it, it, maybe it's error handling. I somehow I have to say. Put a try catch in there. Mm. Yeah, so check what's stored in 5 then. Like is, is it null or is there an actual. So maybe I could say dollar sign computers is the array. Yeah. And then let's see what's in the fifth yeah. array. Well, it would try. If it fails, you could save basically. Well, I think you just did it, right? Yeah. And then it, yeah. but then it skipped five. Um, see, that doesn't have a number across. We don't know what position. Yeah, computers for fifth four. It has to be a computer. All right, so then, okay, so that's saying that. So, so now go back up to where it missed, and is that name above or below it? Neither. Okay, um, so it stored the name. Yeah. Right, so if you check, so four, so check for position three. Go back down. It gets the name before it looks at it. Right. Right, so it's, so it's storing the name, which means it's storing the name. It's got the name. It just so then you know that it's storing it. So if it's storing it, you just have to figure out why it's not running it for that particular user. And so that is that is that something like so then that's um, the machine's not available, and that's why it's not doing it. But the other ones are. Just use your variable with the. With the annotation on it, you nice. don't have to type it. Yeah, cool. That way, if you need to try a different one, you use a different RAM number. And then, and then you want to specify the array. Yeah, well, but you need the name, don't you? If you give it, you send it the whole object. Yeah. So when it uh, can't connect. I can't read that. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> so do it. Yeah. So do it to the one above that. Do it to three since we saw three coming. In. So just same thing, but but array four instead of array three instead of four. So um, really quickly on, on these square brackets, this is something that I've never seen before, and that is it specifically just to select like in this array, select object number. Yes. Whatever. Yeah. Very yeah. commonly cool. in most yeah. programming languages, mm -hmm. there's a couple that don't use it. But, mm -hmm. And but and how would I know that like um, you just know that I need the third object? Is, is there other functionality in here where you could? Feel Depends on if your array is a is a single dimension, double dimension, prior array. Yeah. So you yeah. so you can have multiple positions. You can have array column one, row three. It depends, on, and then that is basically inside of it. And so if you create an array, you can use that bracket system to figure out where in the array you want to be. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a, it's a quick tool. And an and what would that be called? Is collecting the um, item in the array? Indexes. Yeah. Indexes. Yeah. Indexes. Yeah. So think of it as dimensions. Think of it as uh, height versus width versus depth. And basically, you're defining which ones you want to look at. That makes it easier. But this, you can go as far as four dimensions, right? Five, six? You can, yeah, you can actually get, there's some really, really big ones. There's a nice dynamic array that just came out that was iterated in uh, Java, in this version of Java, and it basically can size like 10 or 15 rate pieces. And then you can like scale it up and down. That's super, super great. Oh, is Bauman on uh, doing remoting? Is that what's happening? It's because we're on dollar. I'm doing dollar sign computer instead of computers. Oh. Well, yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> Four. Okay, so access is denied. I'll we'll try that. Yeah, yeah, now do it for three. Yeah. I'm going to change the. So then, um, in that case, where? Oh, it's a one. Yeah, it doesn't like this one either. Oh, because those are all coming up as offline anyway for some reason. Um, Usually do a net connection first to see if the devices are there before mm -hmm. doing an invoke. Oh, I see. I, th I think so that's um, why yeah, it, that it'll say the. Um, oh, it is? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I should read. If else, computer's offline, yeah. Um. But that's how I troubleshoot. You have to find out if it's, yeah. if it's skipping, we have to find out, you know, we have, you know that it stores the name. You know that at least so it has the name. The objects. Um, because it's not offline, it's going to try to invoke the command um, here first. Um, and it, is it because this is what I had kind of thought, right? Because until I had put this error action silently continue, I think it would spit the full error. Um, so then how can I customize the text where I can say error action instead say error or something like that? More yeah. simple. You can put a try catch around it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So you put it inside of a try catch, which tries it. If it doesn't work, it catches it. And then in the try catch, you can actually set a statement. Right. Yeah. So you can be like, if this is the return error, yeah. we'll print this statement. And then it'll just work. That didn't work. Or whatever. Cool. If you can make it say your mama, that's all the. <laughs> so it, you can, for a quick for a quick uh, just demo of how a yeah. try catch works, bring up another window right there. Hit Control J. And go down to try catch. Because these are all the built in snippets that are inside of PowerShell. Wow, this is really cool. I've never seen Right there, see the try catch finally and the try catch? Just hit that and then it'll give you an example of how to use it. So is that it also. It just gives you like boilerplate yeah. that you can use to use it. That's really cool. Is, is that also in VS Code? Uh, yeah, it's just part of. I don't remember exactly how to do it. I, have, I can't remember how to do it. <laughs> Um, there's, there's um, the one that a really cool thing in VS Code is if, if you're writing, um, like if you write the keyword function and then write your, um, like get hyphen something and then do a curly brace and a curly brace, mm. and just above the function, if you do pound sign, pound sign, and hit tab, it'll fill out everything that you have for your parameter block, all the other stuff. That's really cool. Mm. I don't know if you've ever tried that or not. VS Code. What would you call that in VS Code? Uh, snippets. Snippets. <laughs> It'll, there's a thing in there called start snippets, and that's what controls oh, it. Also there. You'd have to look for the same thing um, there in um, with, um, VS Code. I forget the name of it. Well, cool. That's like really cool. I had no idea about the <laughs> snippets. So that's awesome. Um, all right, well, that's all I've got, unless um, 
again, anybody wants to dive into anything else PowerShell 7 related or really anything at all, um, I'll open it up and we'll go. Well, just a recommendation. You might want yeah, to cool. you might want to try looking at doing a PS object. Yeah. Um, because I think what you're doing there would be a lot easier than the PS object up to the CSV file. And rather than like writing host, um, and yeah. so what do you mean um, UPS object? Um, it's a, you can store the entire object inside of a PowerShell file and then you can invoke a command to then print that out into an Excel sheet or CFS. Hmm. Yeah. Um, do you know how to make a hash table? Mm -hmm. uh, and add some, it's an add sign, curly okay. brace, and then you have a name seen that before, yeah. equals value, and then you do a semicolon, and do a name equals value, name equals value. Mm -hmm. That's a hash table, right? Okay. Um, well, if you put PS custom object in front of it, PowerShell will make it into an object for you. So what's really nice is if you put that in line in your for each loop, every mm -hmm. time you loop through it, it'll automatically add it to it. And you can have name and then spit and it out at the end. Like that as your it's really properties. nice. It'll spit yeah. it out at the end. So do you do do you run any modules like something like um, uh, Exchange or any of the other Microsoft stuff? Um, not anymore, not unfortunately. Anymore. Okay. Yeah. Well, have you ever so have you ever like pulled up an object name or like a DL name or a mailbox or whatever, and you like call multiple items on it? It will like set those like this is the permission, this is the person, this is the permission, this is the you know, uh, root line or whatever, and it'll put all those in a row, and that's basically what you can do to set that up. So it'll just give you stuff in a row, and then you can work that out mm. if you wanted to, making it easier to read. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, mm. and then and then you're not calling it every time; it'll run it in the background. And if it isn't printing every time, every time it prints, it slows down the script. Yep. So mm -hmm. every so if you store all the objects and then print it at once, um, that goes from like a five minute runtime to like a two minute runtime. It just slows it down. Cool. Or, uh, if you, but if you have that uh, that PS object in your for each loop, it'll automatically yeah yeah spit automatically it out yeah. for you as it goes through yeah mm -hmm. really yeah cool. well, yeah yeah you can do that too yeah. it looks, way like it. if you if you issue a commandlet like you get service it'll look just it'll be that same output yeah powerful object um so it'll have so it'll be a key value next key value. Like a key value hashed array. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to take a look at that. Because that's awesome. That's a, uh, totally helpful as well. This, this script does take like just over five minutes to complete. And, um, well, uh, well, the one thing I noticed, I'll say this really quickly, is like when it's going through, it seems to like take five seconds per object when in my mind it's like it should be pretty quick because it's doing it if else you know test connection only count one yeah. um and and as we saw like when we ran this thing it was taken even for computers that are offline you know we're waiting now did you run the test connection that was my way of saving time because if it's offline then well no but it then it will command a lot harder to skip it hey uh, no one one have two loops. Do one is doing um, the test, and then in, uh, the test for each connection writes it to an array, and then only talks uh -huh. to the machine that the test returned. Nice. Yep. You could probably use a parallel oh. parallelism at that point as well. If, that, if you do that, mm -hmm. separate the test from outside the loop, and hmm. then you have, have a, one. you have a refined list. I think there's something going on. Maybe in my ah, I know what it is now. Now I know what I was thinking about this. You can use invoke command with a with a uh, array, so you can do sixteen simultaneous connections. Oh, that's why I knew something was off. I said, like, I know what he's doing. I've done this before. That's what it is. You're doing it one at a time. Uh -huh, yeah. Invoke command can actually paralyze up to sixteen connections you put in an array, nice. so it will do it all, and then you can dump it all into. I usually dump it all. Would into that work with try catch? Uh, should maybe. Or just do the try. Yeah, try to just try and put it in the script. Yeah. But yeah, I, I guess could you yeah. get each array out? So, yeah. like, more importantly, do you want to leave the next session, or do you want me to? <laughs> uh, <laughs> either way, um, if you want to do it, I'm fine with it. Yeah, totally. Um, do you want to hook up with them and figure out which one you want to use for next 
Which, the Microsoft guy and on the oh yeah in uh, what is it February? Mm -hmm. And then if you want me to speak one time, I'll be happy to. Yeah, and absolutely. Just pick me if you want whenever you're ready. Cool. And that way, it'll give me time to actually prep. <laughs> I don't have to worry about the meeting that set up. That's sweet. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, exactly. I wish I was a guest speaker. always be the sub dude. You're like fast. I'll fast. let, but uh, <laughs> you can take the reins as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. If you want, that's up to you. I appreciate that. Um, guys, there's an open table too. Like, really uh, great turnout tonight. Um, Oliver is huge help in this. So um, I'd love to have Oliver lead a session as well. But if anybody else in this room ever wants to, to present on anything, um, definitely just get a hold of myself, Tom, or Oliver, and, and we can hook, you know, set something up. I make so. an awful presenter. presenter. <laughs> so do I. So uh, I appreciate you guys um, sticking with me. And um, I, I know I've learned a ton tonight. I think um, quite a few of you guys are definitely high level and, and quite a bit above me, but... Um, I hope maybe at least somebody got, you know, at least everybody maybe got a little bit, um, but definitely like I've taken away a ton from this, so I really appreciate you guys helping me learn, and um, also I don't know what's the best because right now I'm creating the events on Meetup, Eventbrite, and we do it on the site, um, so I don't know what's the best way that we can kind of communicate, but I'd love to open a discussion. Um, we could even do a Slack channel. I think there is a. Um, Black channel already? Mm -hmm. Cool. So maybe we, we decide to reopen that or Discord or I just can't be on it anymore. Discord. Yeah. Discord. Discord. Um, and we can talk about, hey, what do we want to talk about at the next meet? Um, what did you guys enjoy about the last meet or what do you want to see more of? Like, um, would you prefer, like, did you guys, I, I thought watching that Jason video was actually pretty, it was short, but very informative, so. Uh, I'd love to, we can be more collaborative and it'll be an open source user group where everybody kind of contributes and um, so yeah. Well, if somebody wants to suggest tools, that'll be great too. Actually, I have two. Next time you want to show videos, use something called YouTube DL. It will download a YouTube video so that you can show it so you don't require Wi-Fi. Yeah. Helps a lot. Yeah, yeah, good point. It's an open source program that helps tons. And here's another one that I have. Oops, let me switch this off. Um, it is basically called Azure Beta Studio. Now, it has a feature called Notebooks. Now, have any, anybody heard of Python Notebooks? You basically put some code in, and you can run code, and it looks like a notebook. So you have these little sections right here. And uh, you can add code and run it right there, and it'll actually run the code. So it's great for sessions like this, especially if you can get the font size bigger. But it's basically via it's VS Code, and uh, you can just run the code right inside there, and you have uh, what is that called? That font um, where you write where you write the code. It's like uh, shortened HTML. Markdown. Where you can go pound pound. Markdown. It's Markdown. Thank you. Markdown. And. Uh, I think it will help us out a lot if, if, if people use this to show off their code. Cool. Because then they can, and then you can share that with people and they can actually go and execute each part of your code and see the results and modify it and share it back. Because awesome. Notepad helped up as a Python people a lot to get beginners started, especially. Yeah. Because it's more like a worksheet. Hey, <laughs> we're about to do this function. Look at the results. Test, try it out. Do your own thing. It's Azure Notebooks. Yeah, it's called Azure Data Studio. I just learned about it recently. And is that a free one or is it? Yeah, it's a free. It's it's from Microsoft. It is it is written off the same thing as Visual Studio Code, and it also uh, interacts with uh, SQL and a few other languages. So we have Py, Spark, Spark, Python three, SQL. So you can have any Notepad and write up nice comp instead of just comments with your little dash dash, you can actually have markup explaining the whole thing. And I think that includes pictures, hyperlinks, videos you can include wow. in the in the notebook. So That's then cool. then you have a stepped guide to go through. I like the the fact that you showed the, all the release notes and stuff for the PowerShell stuff. You I learned some things that I didn't know was coming. Um, yeah, it'd be really cool if you don't mind putting that link 
Yeah, absolutely. So, so yes. what you showed tonight? Yeah. I couldn't remember what. I tried to find the URL you were showing. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, that'd be really nice if you put it in the speak the like the notes yeah. on uh, what is it WordPress? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll share that um, out of the automator blog that I found as well that has some cool stuff on how to push into your network and things like that. Oh, yeah. So. Uh, all right, yeah, thanks again, guys. I really appreciate it. I'm going to hang out a little bit and, and finish my food and um, kind of hang out. So if you guys want to, but. Do we want to vote on one or three? Oh, yeah. That's up to him. Let's, come Let him. <laughs> um, let's do something fun. Uh, let's do. Stop insulting your customers. <laughs> What's the best way to create an array of these items? And then we'll do get random and then select a random one. Random. <laughs> oh, 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 nice. <laughs> oh, wait. Does random give zero? We said this debate one time. Zero number is too random. I don't know, entire. Add a fake one in the beginning just to uh, blow that out. Yeah, it's actually just random to get random. Um, so what would I say to specify? One, random. two, three. Yeah. Oh, should we just oh, one dot yeah, three yeah, and then? Okay. All right, and then just add random to that. Yeah. yeah. And then what? Get random. Nobody can see what the size is. Oh. Yeah. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Dumbass. All right. Maybe go that way. Uh, input objects. Yeah. So, All right. Or is it Number two. two. <laughs> Improve <laughs> your impact on the info. Well, these are not some results in the customer. Okay. I like that too much. <laughs> Run it again. Best of three. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got one for two and one for one and one for three. <laughs> <laughs> That's That's so so this will be the winner then. That's going to be two. Two. It is two. <laughs> that doesn't seem very random. No, no. <laughs> will it go one? one. <laughs> will it go one? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, guys. Hey, hey. Oh, hey. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> the clear room. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah. Alrighty, yeah, thanks again, guys. Really Azure As Studio, uh, Data, Data Studio. As your oh, yeah, Data Studio. Studio. And it's just like Visual Studio Code, except for yeah. it seems so to be targeted. You can actually get rid of all this. Can you install a notepad feature? Well, I would say you want to basically go to play around. But how mine works is 